As an ER nurse, it was not uncommon to see patients coming in complaining of right upper quadrant pain, radiating up to their right shoulder, some nausea, vomiting, and certainly a good amount of pain. And when we would see that, more often than not, it was their gallbladder acting up. Today, we're gonna to talk about cholecystitis. So cholecystitis is typically caused by gallstones, these stones that form inside the gallbladder and can cause a lot of pain. But people can live with gallstones without having them become inflamed. But if you get too many or they've been in there too long, patients are going to end up with cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder. Uh, about 20 million Americans have gallstones, and there are about half a million cholecystectomies, removals of the gallbladder, each year. Turns out you don't actually have to live with a gallbladder, so we can take it out when it acts up. Risk factors for cholecystitis include obesity, rapid weight loss, uh, weight loss surgery, or someone who has a high fat diet. Genetics and medications can also impact uh, risk factors. So what is the gallbladder? Well, the gallbladder is a small little pear-shaped organ in our right upper quadrant that stores bile. And bile is infused into the lower GI tract after we eat a high-fat meal. It helps to digest fats. And so it's the storage reservoir. The bile is made in the liver and stored in the gallbladder and then pushed out into the GI tract when we need it. And what happens with gallstones is that there is an imbalance um, within the gallbladder itself, specifically usually too high of cholesterol. And then the cholesterol forms into these stones. And these stones can cause obstruction and inflammation. Um, it causes the bile to be uh, stagnant, to not be able to flow freely, and can cause a lot of pain and even spasms. So here's what those organs in the uh, right upper quadrant look like. We've got basically our liver, our pancreas, and our gallbladder all hanging out together and connected through some ducts. And so the common hepatic duct would go up to the liver, that's at the top, and so then as the liver makes bile, it sends it down the common hepatic duct through the cystic duct into the gallbladder for storage. When we eat a fatty meal and our body is ready to use that bile, um, the gallbladder squeezes that out through the common bile duct and down um, through the uh, sphincter of Odi and into the duodenum. And you can see that multiple ducts here kind of all interact with each other. The common hepatic duct, the common bile duct, the pancreatic duct, the cystic duct, this whole system of tubes all interact and deliver uh, these gastric um, components into the duodenum. And so not only can you have um, gallstones in the gallbladder, um, you can have them stuck in the cystic duct or even stuck um, anywhere else along the pathway. And so you can see in this picture that there is a gallstone stuck in the common bile duct. Clinical manifestations include right upper quadrant pain, and because the vagus nerve can sometimes get irritated, you can actually have patients complaining of right upper quadrant pain, even radiating, radiating up to the right shoulder. Uh, rebound tenderness, so uh, when you palpate the abdomen in the right upper quadrant, it doesn't hurt so much when you press as much as when you let go. Um, or guarding, where you go to start you know, palpating the patient's stomach and they automatically have this instinctive uh, you know, wanting to hold their stomach or guard it away from you because they know it's gonna hurt. Patients can also present with fever um, as well as tachycardia. Additional signs and symptoms can include abdominal distension, belching, flatulence as well. There are a number of diagnostic tests that can diagnose cholecystitis. An abdominal x-ray isn't going to necessarily look at gallstones, but it can rule out other causes of abdominal pain, and so typically we start with that. An abdominal ultrasound can certainly find gallstones, as can a CAT scan. Now a HIDA scan is done um, in interventional radiology and a special um, medication is infused into the patient's IV while they're in what looks like sort of like a small CAT scan. And what this medication does is it actually stimulates the gallbladder to start compressing as if you had just eaten a big fatty meal um, and to see how the 
the bile flows through those ducts. And if someone has cholecystitis, the HIDA scan itself is extremely painful because it's it's making the gallbladder contract. It's caught, it's it's simulating that pain that the patient's having. It can be a very uncomfortable test. And a cholecystography is a special x-ray that requires a special diet and some capsules um, to visualize the gallbladder in that special test. Most commonly, these are going to be diagnosed with ultrasound, and if ultrasound doesn't show anything, patients oftentimes will go down for a HIDA scan. Now, more often than not, when patients have cholecystitis, the gallbladder needs to come out. Those stones are not going to be re reabsorbed on their own, and this inflammation is very painful and causes a lot of GI upset. And so this is going to be a laparoscopic um, uh, procedure in the operating room. And so as with all procedures, if patients are going for surgery, they need to be NPO. They need to have an IV started and probably get some IV hydration that'll help them metabolize the anesthesia better. Um, we want to look at any fluid and electrolyte imbalances they may have because this is a GI related issue. Of course, address their pain give them IV antibiotics um, because oftentimes it's not only an inflamed gallbladder, but it can be infected. Um, and then get them down for a laparoscopic surgery. In surgery, the patient will have their gallbladder removed. Turns out you don't actually need this holding reservoir for bile. You don't need a gallbladder. It just means that the patient may have a harder time with high fatty uh, foods or high fat meals because they can't bolus themselves um, with the bile the way that we can if we have a gallbladder. Medications are usually going to be opioids, morphine or Demerol, as well as uh, non-opioid -op medications uh, like Tylenol or some NSAIDs. So let's talk a little bit about opioid narcotics. Um, Meperidine um, or morphine are both examples of opioid narcotics. They are CNS depressants, so we want to make sure we check their respirations and their blood pressure before giving these, but especially respirations. That's the priority uh, uh, assessment when giving opioid medications. They are controlled substances, but patients don't get addicted to these with one or two doses. So sometimes we'll get patients who are hesitant, you know, they'll be in extreme pain and in the ER for something legitimate and want to refuse the pain medicine because they're worried they're gonna be addicted. And it does take, you know, four to six weeks of consistent use of a narcotic before someone becomes addicted. Unless, of course, they have a history of opioid addiction. Um, we would, because these are controlled substances, when you're taking these out of the medication uh, dispensing system, you count the count before you take it out. So it'll ask you when it pops open the drawer, how many vials of morphine are in that that um, drawer and you'll count and you'll put the count in and say okay there are eight vials and then you take your your drug out and that way they make sure that the count is correct um, and then if you if there's any medication that you're wasting you have to have a witness for that waste so let's take say you took out a four milligram vial of morphine but the order was for two milligrams you're going to draw up two milligrams of morphine you're going to administer that to the patient but then you have to go back to the medication machine with the extra two milligrams and a second nurse and and verify that waste together and that's just a way to control um safe medication administration and, and, and make sure that, you know, the medication is being wasted appropriately. Now, opioids um, do have a respiratory depressant uh, feature. And so if a patient becomes over sedated, over treated with an opioid, um, Narcan or naloxone is the reversal agent. And so for these, you wanna make sure that if you're giving an opioid that you have the reversal agent on hand. And if a patient starts breathing less than 12 respirations per minute, uh, you need to have a naloxone administered. Naloxone can be administered intranasal through a spray, um, IM or IV. And naloxone lasts about 60 to 90 minutes. And so at that point, you need to reassess your patient because if the opioid lasts longer than the Narcan did, they may start having those CNS depressant symptoms again. As always, let's go through the nursing process as it relates to cholecystitis. When you suspect someone has cholecystitis, these are the kinds of signs and symptoms that you're going to notice. You're gonna notice that the patient has right upper quadrant pain. They may have a fever and tachycardia. They also may have some abdominal distension and some belching. 
And then they, you can elicit a positive Murphy sign. A positive Murphy sign is when you're pressing down on the right lower quadrant and you ask the patient to take a deep breath in as you press. And that is gonna cause pain for the patient. So you're pressing down on the right upper quadrant, saying take a deep breath, and when they do, that causes pain, and that would be a positive Murphy sign. Nursing diagnoses for cholecystitis include acute pain, a fluid volume deficit, and a knowledge deficit. Again, this is usually something quite acute. It happened suddenly, and they weren't planning to have you know, surgery on a Tuesday morning. And so we need to teach them about the diagnosis and about the surgery and what to expect in the post-op recovery phase. As we look at uh, the nursing process, the next step is intervention. And with intervention, we always think, what actions are we gonna take? What assessments are we gonna make? And what teaching are we gonna do? So if you know someone has cholecystitis, here are the uh, assessments that you're going to make on that patient. You're going to be monitoring their vital signs. You're gonna look at their lab studies. Specifically, their hepatic liver, um, function tests, their liver tests, and their pancreatic enzymes can all be elevated, um, as well as bilirubin. Um, and that's just because the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder, they're all interconnected with those ducts, all in the right upper quadrant. And so with, when one of those organs is inflamed and angry, we can see some irritation and, um, and spike in those lab studies as well. So look for your hepatic studies, look for your pancreatic studies, uh, as well as your bilirubin. We're going to assess skin turgor because we're worried about uh, nausea and vomiting. And we're going to assess pain because these patients will present with significant amount of pain. Do a complete abdominal assessment. We may want to check their stool. Uh, we can look at their daily weights, their intake and their output, and their nutritional status. If the bile ducts are obstructed, it's often common that the stool is going to be light colored or pale or chalky because the bile is not mixing with the stool um, and bile is what gives stool that dark color. So you may notice clay colored stools with a patient with a gallbladder issue. Actions to take may include administering medications as ordered, uh, promoting bed rest in the semi-fowler's position, that's often the position of comfort for these patients, uh, repositioning, offering pillows to help get them as comfortable as possible until they go to surgery, and then the patients may have an order for a nasogastric tube placed to low suction to help with the abdominal distension that can happen with this disease. Patient teaching around cholecystitis is going to be about the disease itself, so patients understand what's going on with them. Um, we're going to teach patients that they need to avoid high fats in their diets because they don't have a storage vessel of bile anymore to help mix with the stool and break down those fats. And so it can cause indigestion if a patient eats a diet high in fat after having the gallbladder removed. Uh, we'll also do general post-operative um, instructions, which we'll talk about on a different day, and T-tube management. Now, some patients after gallbladder surgery, not all the time, are going to have a, a stent put in, um, one of these T-tubes, which is what you see here on the screen, and it allows the, the bile duct to heal after surgery, and it drains that bile out through, um, through a bag, out through their skin, and the dry bile drains out. And then after you know a few days that that T-tube is removed. Uh, I'm gonna put some discharge instructions in the description box below uh, to help you give some information about discharge instructions for T-tubes. But a few ideas here um, are that we don't want the patient lying on the side of the T-tube because it could kink it. We want the patient to take care not to um, do things that might pull it out accidentally, so making sure that they're securing it inside their clothes so that it doesn't get yanked out. Um, making sure that they, when they change the dressing, that they're doing it using a good clean technique. And um, that they contact their doctor if they're noticing any signs of infection or complication. So complications that they'd want to notice and call their doctor for would be including things like a fever, nausea or vomiting swelling or fluid leaking around the tube, new redness or warmth around the incision, um, if their incision isn't healing in three to five days, or if there's a foul smell, or if the tube has stopped draining or it falls out. I'll put additional um, resources, a link to that below, so go ahead and check that out. And our last step of the nursing process is evaluating care. How do we know we did a good job? Well, after surgery and the patient's recovering, there's going to be an absence of pain, uh, the vital signs and fluids should be within normal, 
and their liver enzymes were high and now they're coming back to normal as well as their WBC count is normalizing. So all this inflammation and irritation of those right upper quadrant or organs is all settling back down um, and the patient is not complaining of any GI upset. And that's going to wrap it up for our chat about cholecystitis. As always, thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.